Are, you, are your techniques for uh, easing suffering and sort of uh, cultivating that uh, happy, uh, uh, controlled state of mind unique to you, or are they, or do they still have the universal application? Oh, I mean, the, yes. The sh if they didn't have universal application, it's totally yeah. useless. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the point is that basic emotions are common to all human beings. Mm. Uh, so that's quite clear. So in that case, Buddhism is a science of mind, it's a science of emotion in a way. And so the Dalai Lama distinguishes Buddhist science from Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practice, or Buddhist religion, he says. Buddhist science is investigation of reality, which is same related to all of us, especially variety of mind, you know, emotions. So the Buddhist doesn't have different emotions than anyone, that agnostic or Christian or anyone yeah. we have to us. So now if because it took interest in those and developed some methods of first investigating those and then dealing with the destructive ones and finding antidotes and how you can cultivate antidotes, not just saying, well, this is, anger is bad or whatever, but which kind of anger? Is it is rightful indignation or is it a malevolent anger? And then if so, how can you counteract that? This is science, the science of mind. At least this is what psychology is supposed to be about. So it is clear that Buddhism has emphasized the notion of knowing how for mind functions, you know, dealing with emotions and all this incredible sophistication, you know, 84 different kinds of mental factors, how you do deal with those and all that. You don't really find that taxonomy and this strong endeavor of investigating the mind, how it works, how you can use antidotes, what kind of antidotes, different kinds of antidotes. So that's doesn't mean a superiority, but at least a specialty in a way. Mm -hmm. So in, in a sense, that's why naturally it comes easily in dialogue and even collaboration uh, with psychology and neuroscience and all that, because it's as what it's been doing for centuries. And so I was comforted myself you know, in those discussions with the Mind and Life Institute. We had one on investigating the mind at MIT at Boston in 2003, I think, and then uh, St Stephen Coslin, who is now the chair of the psychology department. And so we were paired, one Buddhist contemplative with one scientist for, for different sessions for three days. And I was paired with Stephen Coslin, who became a good friend. And he said, at the beginning of his speech, and he's quite a, you know, intense and confident scientist, he said, I must begin by a declaration of humility in the face of the amount of experimental data that you know the Buddhist contemplative are bringing in the field of psychology, the experiential, pragmatical data. So I think in that sense, it is universal because if something proved to be a, a fit, correct understanding of the way the mind works, and then efficient antidote for those aspects which are detrimental to well-being, then it has to be uh, universal. Then well, the Buddhist contemplative practice and techniques might be more specific. Some of them, but those who deal with emotion and how the mind works, we all have the mind. Mm. And if something works, it works for everyone. If it doesn't work, it works for no one, including the Buddhist. Okay. So the test is, what does it do? Are you most happy when you're meditating? And if so, are people who meditate happy? Well, meditation can be a challenge because it's sometimes boring, sometimes there are obstacles. But basically, it's like a beautiful journey. So there are ups and downs, but it is a kind of satisfaction of doing the journey itself, even there's ups and downs, because you have a goal, a sense of direction. So yes, the goal is about better well-being, and also you find satisfaction in the process. So the process itself is also satisfactory, because you are engaged. You know, it's like when you, you do hiking or trekking, there's a, there's a distant goal, which is to go to a lake or to some mountain, but even on the path is quite enjoyable, or you might have ups and downs, but still the act of training, like meditation, has some kind of fulfillment, and it leads to a goal that itself is even more fulfilling. Um, how do these techniques actually work, like meditating? Did they work? Did they actually work? Yes, well, they, I think there's two ways you can see that, first through your own experience. Now, of course, if you meditate for years, 
and at the end you still as grumpy and uh, unhappy and so forth, then there's something wrong. And, and so it's a waste of time as well. But some people might get discouraged. Maybe we could say that possibly not fits to everyone. It's, it's quite possible. I mean, naturally people drop out and say, oh, that's not my staff. Uh, but it seems that those who have some, some kind of affinity for it, uh, they do find benefit. But altogether, it seems that over time, it brings some kind of, uh, yes, progress towards better well-being. So that's subjective experience. But then now there's all this study in psychology and uh, with neuroscience that shows, yes, it does change your brain. It changes your brain the way on the functional level and sometimes even on the structural level. I mean, the permanent enhancement of some areas of the brain. And so, and then there are for shorter term of meditation, like eight weeks, 30 minutes a day, already shows uh, physiological changes, your immune system, uh, uh, decrease stress response, like the cortisol in the saliva, uh, a decreased tendency to inflammatory response, which is sort of dysfunctional and unhealthy, much less after a few weeks of meditation. Increase of social behavior, decrease in the area of the brain that has to do with aggressivity. So all that already clearly shown within a few weeks. So it may not be very stable, may not be very big, but it's already clearly there and different from those who did some other control techniques.